uh, Grover today from uh, Rice University. So he just started a faculty position in the cosmology at Rice um, this past fall. Um, so uh, Mustafa, he graduated uh, from Stanford uh, as an undergraduate. Uh, it was 2008. Graduated. Graduated, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so then he did his first postdoc at MIT as a Papillardo Fellow. If you don't know what a Papillardo Fellow is, it's basically one of the most prestigious fellowships you can get in all of physics. So he was one of those at MIT for a few years. And uh, so then he moved to uh, the Copley Institute in Cambridge right? and was a uh, postdoc there for a few years. Uh, he found his way back to the US and back to Texas, actually, because he was an undergraduate at UT Arlington. I don't know if you know, he was an undergrad at UT Arlington. So now he's back in Texas. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about wires and cosmology and what they have to do with each other. Yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's, it's, I was here, actually, a few weeks ago for the past two and it's wonderful to be back again. Uh, I also remember that many, many years ago, when I was first an undergraduate at Arlington, my brother used to go to school here in the medical center. So yeah, I had visited a long time ago. A lot has changed, though. A lot has changed. Yeah. A lot has changed in the last five years. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, I mean it's, 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 food world food. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the change is incredible. OK, so what I'm going to talk about is a connection between wires and cosmology. Uh, before I start this work, uh, I started this work about uh, a year ago. Sort of got started because I was attending a talk and somebody mentioned Anderson localization, and I realized I did not quite understand what that was. So I started thinking about it, and I realized, oh, the things apply in a very different context. So I think about it for a while, and then more recently, about I think in February or so, I started collaborating with Daniel Bauman at Cambridge, and we've started sort of fleshing it out and putting it together. This should hopefully, the paper is not out yet, it should be out within the next month. Okay. Having said that, caveat, this is a work in progress. It's not published yet, so please, if you have any comments or something, please tell me right now, because it's, of course, the best time for me to learn if, you're, if there's something that can be improved, something that is wrong. OK, so before telling you about wires and cosmology, let me start with something that becomes pretty well understood um, and well established, which is the following. So if you were to go out today, at night, and you were to wear the special glasses that I wear, and look into the sky, you would see a sky that looks like this. Uh, you can see the microwave, cosmic microwave background, the temperature of about 3 Kelvin. Okay. It would be pretty uniform. If you adjusted the dial on your glasses a little bit so that you could see contrasts, you would start seeing blotchiness. You would see a yin yang pattern first, uh, and then start seeing more blotchiness at 1 part of 10 to the 5 or so. And as you increase the resolution of your glasses, you would start seeing what W maps are, uh, which is, again, this is 1 part of 10 to the 5, 1 part of 10 to the 6 fluctuations, but much more detailed in the structure. And finally, if we get to Planck more recently, where you have an even better resolution, angular resolution. So what you're seeing here is temperature fluctuations, of course, from about 280,000 years roughly after the Big Bang. And you're seeing spatial variations of this temperature of the sky from the time of the first satellite. So what did we learn from this? It's an incredibly, it's a great journey. You know, started with Kensis and Wilson, and now we're with Planck, and still a lot of things are going to continue on in the future in this enterprise. To me, when I look at this map, what we really learned is that the early universe seems exceptionally simple. In what sense? In the sense that when you look at this map of temperature fluctuations, you find that the fluctuations are mostly Gaussian, as you would think. They're almost scale invariant, that is, equal amounts of fluctuations on different scales. They're adiabatic, I'll explain that a little bit later. And surprisingly, they are what seems a causal, which means that if you look at different regions of the sky and you ask, would light have had time to communicate between those regions by this time in the standard cosmology, you'll find that no. So it becomes surprising why the statistics of different regions of the sky are similar, or why even the temperature is the same in different parts of the sky. So this is what we have learned from this incredible journey uh, that we've been on. So what is it that could do this? In the 1980s, Alan Guth you know, proposed this idea of inflation, which could provide an explanation for the simplicity that we see in the cosmic microwave background. Of course, at that time, the cosmic microwave background, this one wasn't there. Uh, he 
he was intending to solve some other problems as well. But nevertheless, inflation, as I've explained, can provide an explanation for this. First of all, this a causal point. It turns out that if the universe expands in an accelerated fashion, then you would indeed get to a scenario where you would find that different regions of the sky would be correlated with each other. They were in causal contact at what? So it's this exponential expansion that inflation asks for does solve the a causal, seemingly a causal, a causal processes. The Gaussianity is very simple to explain. If you start with zero point quantum fluctuations in space, the sink, then though the statistics will be Gaussian. How do you think about this? Well, the sink of doing, if you take free fields, or for example, a scalar field, and you go to Fourier space, its equation of motion will look like a harmonic oscillator. When you try to quantize it, it's just like quantizing a harmonic oscillator, and we all know that the ground state wave function is a Gaussian. That's where the Gaussian is. Scale invariant, that comes from the fact that this Hubble expansion rate, an accelerator expansion, that h is roughly constant. And that gives you roughly scale invariant behavior. And the adiabatic comes from the fact that all the matter that is produced is roughly coming from the same source. So that's how inflation allows you, or at least seems like a simple explanation that solves this mystery of why we see such a universe in the cosmic microwave. But I put a question mark here for a reason. Because we still don't know what the physics of inflation is. What is it that drove inflation? We don't know how this, whatever drove inflation, how it connects to the rest of some of the physics that we know about. So we still haven't fit into anything else that we know. There's also a huge gap in our understanding, which is that, fine, inflation happened. But if inflation happens, it vacates the universe of most things. But you still need to repopulate the universe with all the particles that we know and love. So how did this transition from inflation to a universe dominated with particles, possibly thermal, happen? That process called reheating is also poorly understood. So the physics of inflation and reheating is poorly understood. Just to sort of drive this point home, we, we've been pretty successful climbing this ladder in energy. E v to m e v to t e scales now with the the questions we are asking about inflation and reheating is potentially a 10 to the 15 G. It's a huge leap that we are asking. It's kind of hubris to say that we know what's going to go on, or we would be able to know very easily. Well, you don't need 10 to a 15 G. You don't. Yeah, I said it potentially could. Right? It potentially could. So now we are in this situation. Okay. So it's high energy processes. You could say, okay, what, is, what could the physics be? You could take, say, maybe unification happens and things get simpler as we go on. A standard model, for example, a nice simplification if we go to high energies. You could expect that. However, when you ask people who are into model building for inflation you know, from stringy perspectives and so on, you'll find that the models are usually quite complicated. You don't end up with a single field. It's actually hard to get inflation. You don't end up with a single field. You end up with many, many fields together. Okay? It's not easy. So it's likely complicated if you take the point of view that the, of the people who are building it here. So it's, yes, inflation solves the problem, but when you go come at it from a model building perspective, it's not simple in any way. So what must, must do in this situation? So in this situation, the, the observations are pointing to a relatively simple universe. What I mean by that is there are very few numbers coming from there. It's Gaussian. It's, it's, there's not much handle there. It's Gaussian. It's scale invariant. It's the simplest thing you can think of. Theory, on the other hand, seems to be saying, ah, things are complicated. So what one must do? First of all, given the complicated nature of the theory, what are the calculational tools that one should have to be able to calculate something that would eventually lead us to predictions of this? And also, given that the observations are simple, perhaps a coarse grain view, we don't need to know all the details of the theory. Perhaps we can get away with a more coarse grain view of, of the theory and do calculations in that sense. It turns out that these last two points, um, you know, similar situations are also encountered, of course, in another region of physics, of course, which is condensed matter. 
Materials are incredibly complicated with impurities and all of these things going on, but you can still make predictions compared with observations. So we found some inspiration from how people understood current conduction wires with impurities on how we were going to deal with complicated scenarios in the early universe, and that's what most of the problems were. Again, let me just point out that in particular, I learned a lot from these review references and review articles in the Finnets Parasite. Of course, Anderson's paper is from it's a classic. Uh, he explained you know, current convection in cold in cold wires. Um, this is, again, I keep on failing to correct this. This should be random lattices, not random matrices. Uh, this is a you know, review articles and so on. And, we, and this is a, again an article. It's a Lazouche lecture notes. This is actually where I started because it was much easier to read, read the Lazouche notes than read the rest of the literature. Um, and on the other side, thinking about inflation, reheating, and so on, of course, uh, there is a large amount of literature uh, on the subject. Okay, so let's get into the meat of it now. Any questions so far? Where I should stop. So let's get into it. Okay, so inflation. So it's expected that inflation takes place, but could could happen because of one or many scalar fields. So inflation happens in some relatively flat region of the potential. It could happen because of one field, but there could be many spectral fields around, or it could itself be a combination of fields. Reheating happens when you know you enter the bottom of the potential, where the dynamics could be quite complicated, and you produce particles. So the fields, if you take all possible fields and you construct an effective input on, then the rest of the fields I will call chi. Those are the daughter fields that are produced. What are the equations of motion for such a field? So here is the equation of motion for such daughter fields. And again, I'm doing an enormous simplification just for the purpose of the talk. What I'm thinking about is there are these fields in curved space time. I'm assuming that they are, you can linearize the fluctuations of these fields. So these are really the equations of motion of the fluctuations of the fields. And I'm going to Fourier space because I can linearize. And I'm assuming an expanding but flat universe. So these are the equations of motion for the Fourier components of the daughter fields that could be produced by inflation during reheating or that could be spectral fields during heating. I've written it down as a harmonic oscillator here. Chi double dot, tau is conformal time, k is a wave number. This effective mass squared basically includes all the stuff that there. It includes effects of expansion, for example. It's on mass. It includes effects of how it is interacting with the other fields you know, at the background. And again, I will go into a more realistic scenario later on. But let's start with this, okay? So all the effects of the complicated background behavior of its interaction and so on are packaged into this effective mass. So if you were to plot this sort of a, this quantity here, and if there are many fields that are it's interacting with at the background level, you find some complicated behavior of this effectiveness. Now, if you tilt your head a little bit, you will find you will of course realize that this equation written here, second order differential equation with a randomly varying sort of effective mass, is identical to a time independent Schrodinger equation. This is just a time independent Schrodinger equation. The effective, you pay space to time, and the effective mass you think of as minus the spatial potential. Okay, it's just second order differential is identical, mm -hmm. not much. Why is this identification interesting? The identification is interesting because this problem here, with random variations in the potential, has been solved. That problem has been solved, and indeed in a beautiful way. The problem was solved by Anderson in 1957. What he showed was that if you take one-dimensional wires, these fluctuations here you should think of as impurities in the wire, the spatial potential here. These fluctuations are impurities in the wire. He showed that if you take one-dimensional wires with any level of impurities, it becomes an insulator. That's a physics statement. A more precise statement is that the wave function gets spatially localized with a characteristic scale. That's what he showed. And this is true in one dimensions, period. As you go to higher dimensions, three, two and three, then you have threshold. Uh, in three, you particularly have a threshold of impurities that is required for you to get localization. But in one day, 
It's a, it's a precise signal. You get the localization of the wave function. So, uh, so one dimension, just the presence of impurities uh, make sure that the wave function is localized. Yes. yes. Any level, I mean, there'll be a characteristic localization link, okay. but it, it, and you, I mean, maybe I'll explain a little bit more. So this XC here is a localization link. Now, by the way, this picture here, which I'll keep on showing here, this is light, actually, in speckled medium, so it doesn't have to be electrons. When you have impurities, you can, this is a wave phenomenon, really. It's not about quantum mechanics, it's about waves. Okay, so given that I've told you that this equation, this Schrodinger equation, is identical up to a certain sign, and we label it to the equation of motion describing the evolution of fields, you should expect similar phenomena here as well. The boundary conditions, or rather the initial conditions, tell you that you consider this tent-like structure of the wave function, you actually just have growth. That's the dominant solution. So you get exponential growth in the solution. Previously, you had to normalize the wave function, so you get tense. Okay. So now, you've, you've just learned that random variations of this mass here over you know, with sufficient number of scattings leads to an exponential growth of this mode functions for the field of this kind. Right now, I've talked a little bit heuristically about you know, this connection between the two, but it's really in, it's really not heuristic in any sense. For example, you can just imagine you know this is a time axis here. In your mind, you've all done quantum mechanics problems of just scattering of a potential one-dimensional scattering. I'm just going to do this in time instead of space. There's time you have some state or some incoming wave. Then there is some effective change in mass. Think of this as a scattering potential, and you'll get some new state here. You can relate the outgoing state with the ingoing state with some matrix here, just like you can write down a transfer matrix or a standard quantum mechanics problem. You can again write down a transfer matrix like this. It's called RT, you know, the transmission and reflection coefficients and the transmission and reflection prob probabilities. It's, it's precisely the same. There's no, no difference. Now what you can do is you can actually calculate, when you make an adiabatic change in the mass, you actually produce particles. At least for me, the intuitive way of thinking about this is, imagine you have a square well. You're in the ground state. Okay? If you move the wall slowly, you remain in the ground state. Move the walls rapidly, and suddenly you are in an excited state, right? because you're no longer in the ground state of the new system. So when you make non-adiabatic changes to your background, you will get particle production. That's what's going on here. And you can calculate the number of particles produced because of a non-adiabatic change in the effective mass or some parameters of the background. And you can relate it to these transmission and reflection probabilities like this. Ignoring the one, the particle production is inversely proportional to the transmission probability. That's what. What if you want to chain together a lot of these non-adiabatic regions? You can just multiply these transfer matrices across these impurities and construct the final state from the initial state in this way. This is all nice. Now the analogy is more concrete and formal, but this is not a great calculational tool yet. To make it into a useful calculational tool, let me show you how this particle production can be it's sort of like it will, as I'll show in the next movie, it looks like Brownian motion. So what I'm going to show you here on the vertical axis is the occupation number or the number of particles produced. It's a logarithmic scale. On this axis right here is time. I'm plotting the log of this quantity n. The black curve that you see is the effective mass. The orange curve, what you see, is the number of particles produced. And you see that when there is non-adiabatic changes, you get this jump. Right? You get this jump in the particles. You get this jump in the particles. And this this will go on, right? And you can see that this looks like okay, something is giving it a kick. Right? You can imagine this as being a drift, a drifting random walk with a directionality, but something is giving it a kick at random things, and the strengths are different depending on what kind of kicks it gets and so on. So this now we did this, okay, now we can do something. We know a lot about how to deal with this random, this kind of behavior with random things. 
indeed what we normally do when we're talking about diffusion and so on, you know, instead of thinking, we can think of either the probability of where the particle is going to go next after the scattering, or we can think of an ensemble of trajectories and talk about what the ensemble of trajectories is going to do. We talk about probability distributions of those ensembles. So here imagine an ensemble of such trajectories. Okay, there are different, we don't know what the, if I was showing you this variation of the mass, we, we don't know exactly what it is, so we consider an ensemble of that. We get an ensemble of trajectories. It turns out, and I will say a little bit more again soon, that you can describe this ensemble of trajectories as how you get particle production in this of this nature with a Fokker Planck like equation. You can derive it from first principles. And the focus, so P here is the probability distribution of these, these trajectories that represent particle production. And mu k is a scale that I'll mention, and tau is just time. So now you have a way of describing how particle production happens in a statistical sense. I don't want to say I know exactly what the behavior of the effective mass is, because that would sort of, that's the whole point, that we won't know that. So we want some statistical tools to do this. So how do I get to this equation? This is I, can't, I won't go into too much detail, but it's derived the same way that any focal Planck equation is derived. You, know, you say, okay, I, I take a piece that I know what the probability is, or rather I take a small piece and I say I know all, the, all everything about this small piece, the probability distribution of variables and so on, attach it to a larger piece and say how do I update the probability. If you assume a Markovian process, you can write down what's called the Smolachowski equation, now you can tailor expand thinking that the change is small, and you'll get a differential <coughs> equation describing how the probability evolves as you add smaller and smaller pieces. Usually you end up with some expectation values related to what is going on in this small piece that you've added that you need to provide. As I mentioned, this focke planck equation that we were able to derive has a scale in it, and the scale is the local mean particle production. So what you should do is imagine you take your, this extent or this interval, you take a small region of it, you do an ensemble average of how much particle production happens in a small patch, and that's what the scale represents. If you want, if you were to do this in wires, this would be the local mean free path. So that's what this is. So this is analog of the mean free path. We have an equation, now we can, this is great, now we can go ahead and do some calculations. Let's calculate some average quantities, right? What is the average number of particles produced and how does it change as a function of time? You find that it grows exponentially. This is what the heuristic part I was showing that there is exponential growth. That's interesting. However, you find that if you now calculate the variance divided by the mean squared, you find that that also grows. So the mean is not a very good measure. The variance is growing. It turns out that instead, if you, call, if you calculate the expectation value of the logarithm of the number of quantum, then it's well behaved, and the variance over the mean squared now decreases. So this you have control over. So this is the thing you should concentrate on. Indeed, as you can expect, this is an indication. It's a lot normal distribution. So you define, we define something called a typical occupation number, or number of particles produced. It's the exponential of this expectation. That also goes in this equation. And we've checked, you know, you take the ensemble of trajectories and plot this typical value, and it's a very good representation of what's going on. So it's a, it's a good quantity to calculate. It's a good thing that this is actually a calculation. It's not that it's, as I'm saying, very not a fit. You can also talk about, you can actually solve this, the focke planck equation in the limit that of large times or a large number of scatterings what you find that it approaches a log normal distribution, but you actually have an analytic solution all the way through. So the fact that you're approaching log normal distribution without much details about the interaction, okay, I didn't say much about what the interactions were and so on. This is what I mean, right, that this universality that's going to be. If you want, you should think of this, this is some version of you know, central limit theory. So now let me sort of be a little bit more honest. Um, I, I've been talking about a single field in a complicated background, and there being particle production happening. But really what I want to describe is many fields coupled together and doing their thing. So 
So those equations, again, this is, I'm linearizing, which means I'm saying that I can linearize about some background solution. But now, this, these are matrices, these are summed over. So there are co many coupled fields together. And they form basically a system of second order equations. Luckily for us, this similar problem maps precisely to current conduction in thick wires. What we mean by multi-channel is not what the picture actually shows here, not multiple wires, but if you take a wire with a cross-section, there will be quantization in the vertical direction, as a result of which the channels to which you're propagating are coupled to each other. It's just a quantization. And, I mean, if you've done an EM problem in waveguides and so on, you know that boundary conditions and the fact that you have to quantize in this direction couples things in the other. So that's what we mean by multiple channels. So multi-channel conduction with random impurities has been analyzed before. And this, there's a huge body of literature on this on the kinesmatic side. So we wanted to adapt this to our particle physics picture again, or our particle production picture. And it's not that difficult. Okay? So now, again, remember I had shown this, that you have a transfer matrix that tells you how its state goes from here to here, here to here, here to here. At that time, it was a two by two matrix with transmission reflection coefficients. Now it becomes transmission reflection matrices. Okay? So it's, it's an NF, but number of fields, it basically scales the size of this matrix, but the generalization is not too big. There you have occupation number or the number of particles just related to a number, which was the transmission probability, was the inverse of that. Here the occupation number is really an occupation number matrix. You can take the trace of that to define the total occupation number, and that can be related to transmission and so on. But it's, now it's less useful. So you can just talk about this. There's an occupation number matrix, which is basically, it scales as the total matrix M times M down. This is a Hermitian conjugate. We can also, just like before, we can now derive a multi-dimensional Fokker Planck equation for all of those different fields coupled together. The variables here, Na, instead of just being the occupation number of a single species, Na, with A going over all the species, now represents the occupation number of all the species. P is the probability joint probability distribution. It's really these are eigenvalues of the occupation number matrix. And there's again a scale, UK. And F here is the number of fields. So you can derive this. And this equation, apart from a trivial sort of rescaling and some new definitions, it is the same equation that was derived by Docker, Mello, Pereira, and Kumar for the condensed matrix. You just have to sort of, the variables we are interested in is different. For, for the physics that we are interested in, so you have to write the equation in a different way. But they derive this. This mu k scale that appears is again the mean particle production rate. Now it's the total mean particle production rate. So it's not just for one, one field, it's a sum over all the fields. We can take this uh, framework that we've developed now for multiple fields, again repeat the calculation. That is, we've got an equation that describes probability distribution of these particles produced. We can go ahead and calculate the moments of the distribution. The first moment of the mean, again, has an exponential in it, but it's scaled by the number of fields now. Again, this quantity turns out not to be great because the variance over the mean squared grows. So instead, now we take, as before, the logarithm, and that turns out to be well behaved. The typical number, again, has a nice exponential scaling, but now has some effects of the number of fields involved in it. Notice here that when the number of fields is large, this part drops off and you just get exponential. I don't want to say too much about this, but you know, we tested this, all of these things we tested numerically. But we tried to see, I mean, in very simple scenarios where we had, in the multi-field case, we went up to 10 fields, coupled them together. We assumed, for example, that the interactions were delta function interactions and so on, they were uncorrelated. We checked it, we found, again, we found this very good agreement with the predictions of the Fokker Planck equation. Uh, everywhere we have tested, we found very good agreement. So it's worthwhile just step back a little bit. So what have I done? As I started with this complicated problem of many fields interacting in a cosmological background. They're interacting in a complicated way, many non-idiomatic interactions going on. 
But under some assumptions, which I'll say in the next slide, I've reduced the problem to basically calculating a local mean particle production rate and the number of fields. Those are the only things that appear in the Fokker Black equation. Solving is equals. This is analogous to what is done in the Kenneth's method part, where you reduce this complexity of all the impurities into some ballistic mean free path, which we really obtain from experiments, and the number of channels for basically the geometry of your wire. We're expecting that mu k perhaps either may be calculable if you just write statistical information about the microphysics, or we should look for observables where mu k also comes in. There are some caveats, um, which I sort of have brushed away so far. In deriving the equations, I assume that the different fields were statistically equivalent. As over a long enough period of time, they're all interacting. There's no, but at the end of the day, if you waited long enough and you saw what, what evolution that each field see, you could see something similar. So this is an assumption. Otherwise, things get very complicated. In an expanding universe, there's also an adiabatic evolution of the parameters okay, because of expansion. I've not included that in the problem yet. If you want to take a slightly more highbrow approach to this, a lot of these things that I've been saying based on the Fokker Planck equation that requires you to make assumptions on the strength of the, or some weakness on the strength of the interactions, you can get rid of that by going to random matrix theory. And you can, in fact, from there, without any restrictions on the strength of, of the interaction and so on, you can predict this exponential behavior from there as well. This is something we haven't explored at all. Um, it's something you know, we've just read up on it to understand how, how this could be applied. But certainly it seems shows promise and can generalize what we've done in a situation that cannot, that do not fall under the assumptions that I mentioned earlier with this. This is the flavor of this, so why random matrices are helpful here. There are two sort of large numbers. One is the large number of fields that you could imagine having. That's one large number that helps you. So from random matrix here, you can get a prediction for the eigenvalues of this transmission or transfer matrix if the number of fields is large. If the other thing, other end that helps you is if you have a large number of non adiabatic events, that is a large number of scatterings, you multiply a lot of these matrices together. And again, there's a non-random limit. And so this is sort of like a central limit theory of consciousness. That you get non-random limits when you multiply a large number of matrices with random entries under some assumptions. Okay. Uh, any questions? So you have like so like there's a fundamental theory which predicts like these interactions, say. Yeah. You, you, so your theory basically says, I mean, that right now you have not, you, you say nothing about the nature of these interactions. You just say something about, say, number of fields and mean number of fields and mean number of. I mean, you you do a type. If you give me some statistical information, okay, that these interactions have this kind of distribution of strengths and widths or something like that, I can make a prediction. But again, as I would say, the hope is that you want to look at observables that could even be independent of those details. So my goal is not to actually know what the fundamental theory is, although that would be great. Yeah. My goal is to be able to make predictions. Yes? You introduced a matrix for mixing of different particles, species. Yes. yes. But you didn't say anything about mixing of modes for a single field. Yes. Uh, and uh, what amounts to the same thing is you're assuming that this effective mass is a function only of time and right. not of space. That's right. Isn't that sort of unrealistic? So it's. It's not unrealistic initially, because initially when you can linearize your, your so you have, in, at least as far as we can tell, our cosmology is a pretty good approximation to an FRW universe. Mm -hmm. So Friedman, Ross, Walker, spatially homogeneous. Mm -hmm. So I'm allowed to linearize my fluctuations mm -hmm. around this homogeneous isotropic background. So as a result of which, the linearized equation in Fourier space only have time dependent coefficients. Okay, so you're working in a, Effectively, in a Robertson Walker space right. with a with a um, radius function, or whatever you want to ca call it, that is this very random function. That's right. uh, yes, and the other thing I would also mention is that I would, in the application, this is in fact excellent because the next slide will address or not address, but this is something we're looking at, right? So 
because you create fluctuations from this, gravity of course is spotless, and it will create, even if you don't have spatial correlations here, gravity will correlate them. So you have to actually deal with that. And it's, but it's, let me just go to the next slide. <laughs> it's easier, but it's an excellent question. And uh, let me just try to answer. So what I've done so far is I've told you, okay, there's complicated background dynamics. It leads to particle production. It leads to particle production, which we can now characterize quite well. However, this particle, uh, assumed as the question was asked, you know, assume that it's in a homogeneous isotropic background. This is not completely realistic. You know there are fluctuations. So how do you get, you, can, you should ask the questions about correlations between different Fourier modes, not just for a single Fourier mode. And that's the next step of the calculation. So that's basically this sort of schematic here, which is again work we are current, we started already, but we have no results yet with uh, myself and Ivan and, and we. So the idea is to do correlations between different Fourier modes within single or multiple fields. That's what really you would need to talk about observations. So that's the inflation part. This is part is actually genuinely, it's, it's, I'm really interested in completing this soon, sooner rather than later, because this is the part I think that has the most immediate impact on observables. If you could calculate this, and I could show some universal behavior in the nature of curvature fluctuations that emerges, because even with many of these fields, I'd be quite excited. Non Gaussian, non observational, non Gaussian. How do you Sorry? Just uh, when you apply this non observational, non Gaussian, yes. so then how this whole thing is that they are introduced? So that, that tells you something about. Yeah. So we naively you would say, okay, because we don't see non we don't see any non Gaussianity, there cannot be many fields. I don't think that's necessarily true. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not necessarily true. So the whole point of this calculation is to see whether you have many, if you have many fields, is it natural to just expect non Gaussianity? Or is there some universal, universal behavior that says non Gaussianity will be small? Because all the non Gaussian calculations done very specific yeah, no, construction right. made to enhance non Gaussianity. Right? A lot of the times, the constructions that are made, I mean, obviously, because before, the, before uh, Planck, they were done to enhance on their sense. The question now is more general. Like, do you expect this generally? Yeah. And I don't have an answer yet. Um, so I, I can't say anymore. In the reheating side, I didn't go much into, into detail about this, but the earlier studies in the 90s, these classic papers, uh, what they did was they studied how, if you have an oscillating background, this is the infoton, how it impacts particle production. Um, and a lot of studies were done in this context. What we can do with the framework that we're supposing is we can tackle many, many, much more complicated scenarios. Okay? Now we don't care whether this is periodic or not, whether this is oscillating in a uniform way. All we care about is are there non-adiabatic events, and are there random enough and enough number of them, and you can do the calculations. And I think this would be a wonderful tool. However, one should be careful because exponential growth cannot go on forever. It's going to get stopped. Nonlinearities will become important. This cannot be the final answer. In inflation, perhaps, Expansion curtails it and it stops at some point. Then reheating it's hard and you will have to go to nonlinear simulations eventually. Again, I've already mentioned some of this, so I don't want to again belabor this. Uh, what kind of outputs should you expect? You know, some characterizable perhaps noise in the spectrum. Deviation from Gaussianity and what level? We've already the questions have already been asked about this. For the reheating aspect of it, you know, what is the efficiency? How quickly do you reheat the universe? What is the scale dependence of how modes get populated? And perhaps some other applications that, don't, that we haven't thought about in the early universe where similar assumptions, like you know, having a relatively uniform background, but with lots of interacting components. What is it? OK, so I'm almost done. Just to take us back. And we started with this. This is the biggest picture of the universe that we have, or at least a cartoon of it. What I was talking about was, you know, based on observations here, you've learned something about what's going on in inflation, but we don't know what the physics is of inflation as well as reheating. It's not that it's happening at very early times. And we have little hope of getting direct access from colliders if the energy scale is so high. What I've provided is sort of a statistical tool, but theoretical complexity, there's a lot of theoretical complexity. When there's enough theoretical complexity, it seems that there is there are hints of universality emerging, which are interesting. And it's a hope. 
or pipe dream that perhaps you observe simplicity is just is not indicative that the theory was simple or there was just one component, but rather many interacting components are giving rise to the simplicity. That's all I have. Thank you. So, so I see that you may get some universal, but do you have a real example, like uh, where you have uh, tried this? A real example of rather using a potential and then uh, try to unpack like, No, as, as yet we haven't. What we have done is we have assumed that there's a potential, yeah. right? but we have assumed that the effective mass, the best thing we have done is assume that they have random widths of, with a hyperbolic secant as a shape. They have widths and heights. But we haven't done it. And completely fair point that maybe it will turn out that realistic potentials can't be done. But I don't see why not. I mean, no, no, it's possible. It's, because, uh, for the inflection point, we yep. found the universal classes, like I see. ADE classification and all these things that showed up. Like I see. All these I see. Yeah. Things. But uh, what I was expecting that you will get to see some classifications like that, but we haven't gotten there yet. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get there. But we have right now. We just haven't gotten there. It would be it would be great if that actually. Yeah. Um, and we should talk about it. You can tell me a little bit more about. It. And also, uh, you know, like uh, power separation. And when I saw your uh, whole thing, I think uh, you can attack that from a general perspective. Yeah. Because, because there could be a particle production at the beginning of the right. Right. that could That could suppress it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and it could be sort of a yeah. hysteresis sort of effect yeah, exactly. that, that surpasses. Absolutely. And at the end, maybe the initial condition, maybe you can uh, get to that's true. We haven't, so right now we assume much Davies. I know, uh, but, uh, but it might not, I mean, again, it might not be that relevant because we, after enough interactions, I cannot imagine there being a large sensitivity, at least to the scale. I, I agree, but to the small loss, there will be sensitivity. That's true. There, for that specific thing, yes. But not because for nowhere else you see the uh, initial condition. So. True. <laughs> I should. So any other questions before I? Is there any other questions? There's, there's something else that's bothering me. I'm yes. having a little bit of. By, by the way, it was really a fascinating and intriguing talk. Oh, so thank you. Very much. Uh, but you, could you go back to the slide that came about 20 minutes from the beginning that was labeled something like particle production as scattering? Yes. Uh, I think that would make it easy, easier for me to ask my question. Was it? I'm suffering some cognitive dissonance because, on the one hand, you're telling me things that I know and believe about that. I think you just went. Um, okay, yeah, good. About Anderson localization, yes. but then there's something else that I know and believe about. Um, oh, yeah. The, the, I guess this is the one. Uh, the normal way of normalizing the wave functions are the, these functions of tau in the cosmological problem is not quite the same as in standard scattering. Yes, absolutely. Right? Because here you have a unit strength thing yes. coming in, and you have two things coming out that satisfy alpha squared minus yeah, exactly, squared exactly. equals exactly. one. Yes, yes. Whereas in scattering theory, you have something of unit strength coming in, and then things come yeah, exactly, out in both exactly, directions, exactly. Um, which may, it is sometimes confusing. But the, 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 the point I wanted to make is that these these functions have, have uh, a, a satisfy a Ronskian relation. Yes. This alpha, alpha squared minus beta absolutely. squared is equal to one. Or in other absolutely. Words, this is, it corresponds to conserved current. Absolutely. The, the, absolutely. Uh, well, maybe I'm answering my own question. Because, now, I had never until today considered the possibility that a solution of that time dependent e e equation as a function of time might be one of these localized Anderson things. So, so what happens to the the Ronsky in an apex, is it identically zero for all of those states, or is it something Which state? that, that uh, starts out? Of course, of course the, if we look over there in your picture on the right hand side, the individual terms could be very large. That's right, absolutely. And, and yeah. the, the difference between yes, them always, yes. is equal to one. Yes. But is something like that happening for the, in the case where the function is a localized? I mean, that has a localized function. Yes, yeah, so that, OK, so uh, <laughs> this is great, because I don't think I've ever had actually this detailed question asked. Because it's a very, I actually, to be, to be frank, I understand it much better in the particle production case. 
Whereas an Anderson localization case where you actually have this very precise condition where you have to actually get a tent mm -hmm. of localization. <coughs> I, I don't know of how to really satisfy it apart from saying that I need the wave function to be local. On this branch it is satisfied, mm -hmm. on this branch it is satisfied. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't know precisely how to connect it and say what happens there. I basically construct this tent because I know that the wave function has to be normalized. Okay, so it's, oh, a, okay. it's, a, yeah. it's a post statement. It's not, it's not like my solution does this. Mm -hmm. I just say it has to do this, otherwise I can't, I can't normalize. So this is the only thing possible. If but you I have don't, an eigenstate. If I can, yes. So I can't, so if you're asking how does the solution know, in some sense, right? So the middle, then, then the how do you know it's a tent? It could be this, and then it can come from the hyperbole. Well, because the solutions show. Yeah, well, in the middle, okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, in the middle, it can start from the. Uh, absolutely. But this is a. It doesn't matter. Though, yeah, it doesn't matter. This is an average state. Right? Yeah, exactly. No, absolutely. So the tent may not be there. Tent may not be, but it's because far away, though, if you look at a long yeah, yeah, distance, exactly. region, you will see this behavior. Exactly. In the middle, of yeah, course, yeah. the wave function could do this, this, this. Yeah, That's perfect. Yeah. But in the long distance behavior, because you have two exponentials, it should do that. In fact, somebody, has somebody actually thought about. Because I've looked at the literature on Anderson localization, and you find very little discussion. Yeah, exactly. Very it's little very discussion good. of this. And it's, it's something that has to happen because, you know, in nature it happens. But nobody talks about that in detail about how it actually comes. Only one sort of semi popular article that I read had a discussion of this. But it's also punts in the end and says exactly what I'm now punting on, which is mm -hmm. it's normalization. So it's much easier, so, the particle physics context is much easier because it's just one direction. I think you were interrupted before you yeah. made your point. Are you going to say that, that in this cosmological case, you don't necessarily have a tent? You have just exponential, just exponential. on one side. Exactly. And then, uh, yeah. exactly. Whatever happens. And then whatever happens, when it becomes large enough, you can no longer linearize your equations. And then you, the nonlinear interactions, mode coupling and so on, will become important. So this only remains valid up to that point. And, that, and sometimes people think that that's there's no regime like that, but there is. There is a large regime where you can you know, linearize your growing exponentially, and but still not long. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, yes, sir. One of your blocks uh, you had uh, like M effectors, uh -huh. like with those uh, sort of uh, had some uh, fluctuations. So uh, like it's a function of time. Yes. So uh, what is the distribution it's following? Like because unless it's following some sort of uh, distribution. Uh, we can't really get uh, a lot of information about the number of particles. The distribution of the particles. So, the, so the assumption I had made, in the, just to answer your first question, the assumption I had made there was they were hyperbolic secants. And each of them was hyperbolic secant. And I had chosen their widths and heights from a Gaussian distribution with certain, certain parameters. And I had distributed them at random. So I had said that in this interval, I want 100 of them. And they were picked at the location of picked at random. But that was the assumption that I made. Now, when you, in a more realistic situation, there will be one thing, two things that will be important. Because of expansion, the, the strengths of the interactions, they're likely to change it adiabatically. And there will also be a fact that the separation between them, even if I, in some sense, assume that in field space is periodic, because of expansion, they will, they will be, again, adiabatically sort of changing. So that has to be included to get a realistic prediction, but that's not included. You could say, how would we know any of this? Well, we won't, we won't know exactly what the shape of this interaction is. But the whole point is that even though there I chose the set, I could have, I've also done this with delta functions, the answers won't change. Uh, the detailed effects of the shape, as long as your wavelength is long compared to the width of these potentials, it doesn't care about exactly what the object is. It could be a delta function and be fine. So in nature, uh, is, it, is it like, all these uh, MF fluids, is it changing so drastically within a, uh, within a short period of time? It's not, well, it depends on, it's not short. I don't know what you like, mean by short here, but. Uh, you have uh, tau, tau, yeah. and uh, you have all these fluctuations. So, like, is it? Certainly, so let, give, let me give you a, I mean, instead of inflation, let me give you an example of reheating, right? At the end of inflation, this field is oscillating. Okay. Every time the field goes to zero, you have a huge non adiabatic condition that's satisfied. Right? So, so if you write down a it's an equation like this and if you 
satisfy this condition. We'll get part of the production. When does this happen? So for example, if this potential was case, or this omega was something like this, where phi is the background thing that's oscillating, you'll find that this condition is satisfied every time this field goes to zero. So you will get repeated. I mean, this is not, again, very accurate. But you think of this, the, the field thinks, oh, I'm massless, right? Because whenever it's going to zero, it's like, oh, I'm massless. I can produce. I have a large phase space. I have a large phase space. It's not accurate. You should really, not even with the city is what's really doing it. But you can think of it. So it's not that crazy. I mean, again, even in inflationary model building, uh, so this was in reheating. This is quite natural that this happens repeatedly. The inflationary model building, these monotropy models and so on, I mean, I'm not sure what you They also have periodicity in field space built into them, so you can repeatedly get part of the production there as well. So, so it's not, I don't think it's, that part I don't think is crazy to imagine the direct reactions. Okay, so maybe we'll uh, thank Mustafa again. Um, and, uh, Before you guys go, So I, have, uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about I'm here for this today, so if you guys are interested, please, this is sort of advertisement for things I think about. Uh, I think a lot about I love solitons and the interactions. So you know, I do a lot of, uh, I've been thinking a lot of the analytics side of you as well as from, you know, I also do some numerical simulations. So if you're interested in them, please do ask me. This is an example of soliton formation. I was talking, telling you a little bit about this blob formation. So this is in scalar fields. You get these localized pseudo solid form formation. If you're interested in spectral distortions of the public microwave background, uh, interested in them as well. I don't think anybody here is interested in planets. I actually think about it. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. So, yeah, you're on the rest of the day. So. He's actually in Rice, so we'll see more of him probably. Thanks a lot for coming, guys. Appreciate it. Did you want to maybe tell me what you're working on? Do you have maybe 15 minutes right now? Uh, give me one second. Sorry, question. Actually, maybe just uh, uh, in a few minutes. Maybe just tell me what you're working on. He's, he's, he, no, he knows a lot about it. He knows a lot about it. He's not even got it. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so you guys can talk now. If there's time. This seems to simply want to look at this matter. Oh, I don't know. I never, I never usually turn it off. It's on, I think. Does it do it? No. Yeah, that's right. We'll be on, on the internet. Yeah. <laughs>